Hi everyone, I'm Jonna Devereaux, clinical pet nutritionist, owner of Fetch RI, a holistic pet boutique and supply store, and the director of nutrition and wellness for Bow Wow Labs. And I'm lucky enough to have joining me today, Dr. Judy Morgan, to discuss all things ticks, specifically Lyme and Lyme disease. Dr. Judy Morgan is a world-renowned author, and she is also an amazing integrative holistic vet. Having practiced for 36 years in her clinical practice, she has retired, and now she is offering her services, her knowledge, and her time to help all of us make our pets live as long and happy as possible. Dr. Judy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, so we were talking a little bit prior to pushing the record button about Lyme disease. I mean, obviously, uh, with the spring weather coming about, this is when everyone starts noticing ticks and start looking at these things. And when most vets are, you know, pushing Lyme vaccines and whatnot. So before we jump too far into the gut of everything, um, there are a lot of different ticks out in the world. They're not all the same species. Do they all carry disease? Well, they all carry disease, but they don't all carry Lyme disease. <laughs> and, and actually, I can't, they don't all carry disease. They, they all have the potential to carry disease, but they don't all have the potential to carry Lyme disease. And that's actually one of the fallacies is that people think that any tick they pull off their dog or themselves could potentially be carrying Lyme disease. And there's really only one species of tick that carries um, Lyme disease, and that's the Exodes tick. And uh, that's also known as the black-legged tick. And there is a, um, a species of Exodes that lives on the East Coast. And then there's another species that lives on the West Coast and they both can carry Lyme, uh, but they're both the, the same general. They're, they're a black-legged tick. So there's a Western black-legged and the, the one that we have so on the East Coast. So deer tick would fall under that, I would That's add. the deer tick. That's yeah, deer. that black-legged okay. tick is the deer tick. So the, but the Lone Star ticks and the dog ticks do not carry Lyme disease. Right. They carry other bacteria. Yeah. That they have the potential to carry other problems. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, okay. So let's just say that you go out in the woods or you're out even walking your dog on the street if you're along, you know, have high, tall grass or whatnot around you. I mean, it doesn't take much for a dog, I'm sorry, for a tick to, you know, just brush up against it and get on your dog and then attach. How long um, does a tick have to be attached for transmission of that bacteria? And I'm just saying in general, not necessarily Lyme. I know it's sometimes a little bit different, but in general, what is the least amount of time a tick has to be attached before bacteria can be transferred? 24 to 48 hours. So, okay. you know, if you just find that tick crawling on your dog or you find a tick that has attached, but it's not blown up, it hasn't had a big blood meal, probably has not been on there long enough to cause a problem. So, I mean, that's amazing to hear. And I know I do tick checks all the time. I actually made a song out of it and I do it with my dogs and they think it's like, you know, happy fun time. They think they're getting pet, which they are, but they're really getting checked for ticks. Um, what if you do find a tick on your dog, I know most people, the first thing they do is go for tweezers and I am a big advocate. You do not go for tweezers and Lola is going to squeak on her toy at my feet. I'm sorry, everyone, but um, how do you recommend removing a tick that is attached? Well, so it's, there are actually tick tools for removing them. We actually just got some in on our website and there's a bunch of different ways you can get them, but if you've ever seen, and I wish I had a picture of it that I could put up, if you've ever seen a close-up, like microscopic view of the tick mouth parts, they have this um, long tube that goes through the skin, and it's uh, and that long tube has rows of spikes. And so they stick it in and the spikes are sticking up this way along it. So when you go to pull it out, you're trying to pull against all those little spikies that they have. And then they actually have two pinchers that they grab on either side of that. So that's why um, so commonly you, you people say, I don't think I got it all. I don't think I got the head. Well, here's the thing. The head can't live without the body. So it's going to die. Don't worry about it. It's going to die. And, you know, the mouth parts will back out. Um, but they are difficult to get out. So you can try a couple of things. You know, sometimes you can get them to loosen up a little bit. If you put a little alcohol or witch hazel or Vaseline, leave that on for a couple of minutes. Like the Vaseline kind of sort of smothers them a little bit. Yeah, it suffocates them, yeah. So something like that. 
may, may be helpful in getting them to loosen up a little bit. Um, but actually, let's just say that you have an open cut on your finger and you are grabbing that and some of the saliva from the tick leaks into like an open cut that you have, you could potentially be exposing yourself to something as well. I mean, it's very low risk. Um, so I do recommend using some sort of a, a tick tool. Um, and there are, you know, there are tweezers, there are other ones that have like a little prong thing for getting down kind of under the mouth parts, and, you know, trying to kind of flip them out a little bit. But if you can sort of paralyze the tick a little bit first, I think it helps. So maybe even using like one of our essential oil repellent sprays, um, something like that could help, you know, numb down that tick a little bit and get them to maybe want to loosen up a little bit first. I've, I've actually used um, some natural repellent, some with essential oils and used that and kind of rubbed it in and you are, you're smothering the tick and then it, they do let up enough that they'll come out. Um, you know, a lot of people to that point, when you say, once you get the body from the head, the head can't live on its own, right? A lot of people, I think, feel they have to get it all out. And if they don't get it all out, they're going to cause a problem. And there's bacteria transmission that can still happen. And then they go digging. And when they go <laughs> digging, then they're opening up further back. <laughs> right. So the veterinarian says you can leave the head in there because the body will work it out. So now you don't have to go. <laughs> It'll <digging>. be. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. going to fall out eventually. <laughs> right. Um, so would you agree that in the world of ticks and tick-borne diseases that Lyme is the most difficult to treat and has the potential for most damage to a, to a dog or even a cat's body? No. Okay, so tell us more. <laughs> I don't think it's the most dangerous or the most lethal. Um, I mean, there, we, in Australia, they have tick paralysis. We can see it here occasionally, uh, just not as often. Um, there are ticks that can cause much worse problems. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, I think, is worse. Anaplasmosis, if they actually get a full-blown case and ehrlichia, they, they can be just as dangerous because some of those diseases have the potential to kill them more immediately. The problem that we have with Lyme disease, it's more drawn out mm -hmm. because when an animal is bitten by an infected tick and they actually get an, a Lyme infection, it can take two to five months for the symptoms to show up. So you've had this chronic problem in the body for a really long period of time before you know about it. So that's why we get a lot of the chronic symptoms that, that we see. Um, but there are other tick-borne diseases that can be more immediately fatal, that your animal could be dead within a couple of weeks of the transmission. So, uh, you know, I, I know that everybody gets all worked up about Lyme disease, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about the vaccines at some point, but it's one of the reasons why people get kind of crazy and say, oh, no, I have to vaccinate for Lyme. And I'm like, well, what about the other 10 tick-borne diseases? Yeah. I mean, we don't vaccinate for those. Aren't you worried about those? I think it's much more critical to worry about keeping ticks off your dog than it is to try to prevent one single disease. Lyme just happens to be the one that we hear about the most. It's the one we right. talk about the most, but I don't think it's the, the most deadly of what we have out there. And I think it has the most systemic underlying issues, right? That it has, it really responds negatively to inflammation and to joints and then starts attacking the, the internal organs over a longer right. period of time, which is probably why it gets more attention because the ehrlichiosis and the anaplasmosis are more of an acute, it happens really yeah. super fast. So people just immediately, you know, there's, there's no time to think about it, right? right. Um, so you mentioned about some of the symptoms. What are some of the symptoms? And let's just talk about Lyme for now. Um, what are some of the symptoms for you to watch out for if you've pulled off a tick? Now, depending on what stage of the life cycle the tick is in, obviously you may not ever find if it was a nymph and it had bitten your- Right, because the nymphs are the size of a poppy seed. So, and, and the nymphs, um, interestingly, are more likely to carry the disease. Uh, and so, but, but getting into a tick bed, uh, you know, if you're walking through the wood and all of a sudden you look down and there are a thousand poppy seeds covering your dog, that's a much bigger problem. Much bigger. We would have those dogs come in the clinic and it's just like, you've got to be kidding me. We would sit there for hours pulling those little buggers off cool. of them. Um, I got into a nest once when I was in about seventh grade and I literally was just covered my mom threw me in the hottest bath water that I could tolerate trying to kill those little buggers because you couldn't pick them all up. There were just hundreds, 
hundreds. So, uh, so gross. those actually, <laughs> yeah, those can be a, a much bigger problem. Um, so, uh, like I said, the symptoms may not show up for two to five months, particularly if we have a chronic problem. But there was a, a study done where they were actually doing a test for the vaccines uh, for a new vaccine, but they took uh, beagle puppies and um, infected them. They put infected ticks on them. So they knew that they were infecting them with the disease. And um, almost all of them showed no symptoms. And the ones that did show symptoms, they showed it within, within a few days actually. And it was transient, like, yeah, I don't feel so good. Maybe I'm a little bit limpy, gimpy, maybe off my feed. And it was gone after two to four days. So many, many times people don't even realize that their animal got infected because the symptoms can, can be really very mild. It can be just a, uh, I don't feel that great. Maybe I'm a little slower eating my food. Uh, maybe I skip a meal. Maybe I'm laying around more because you know your dog doesn't say, oh, I just feel kind of achy all over. Um, so a lot of times people don't even notice that transient two to four day thing where they're just kind of a little off. Um, I had all of my dogs get infected with Lyme one time. <laughs> my uh, Doberman went through some high grass and brought a bunch of ticks in that I didn't realize. And uh, about a week later, I came up from the beach, opened the door and my little uh, English toy was standing there on three legs, holding her leg up with a big swollen knee. Oh. And I went, huh. <laughs> and every one of my dogs got Lyme from that. Uh, so, you know, we just treated everybody and they all did fine. So you can see swollen joints. You can see um, lethargy, uh, loss of appetite, uh, you know, maybe a little touchy, grumpy, like I just ache all over. Um, or you may not notice any of that. And three months down the line, all of a sudden they're drinking more, they're urinating more, um, they're having seizures, uh, they have heart arrhythmias, which you may not notice that. My mother's dog, so this was back in 1986, so way back before we really even knew much about Lyme. Right, yeah. Um, she had a Doberman and I had her in to do a dental and I did a pre-op EKG and it was horrible. Like I looked at it and went, whoa, this dog has a heart problem, what's up? So I started running a bunch of tests on the dog and she was Lyme positive and we treated her for Lyme. And after she finished her month of treatment, we did her EKG and it was perfectly normal. So she was one of those who got a myocarditis from the Lyme organism. And that's not something that we see as commonly. Um, and this was before we really even had a lot of information about Lyme. We got a lot of our information in the nineties. So it can affect them in a lot of different ways, but that dog was completely asymptomatic. I never would have known that she had an issue except that I did an EKG as a pre-op. So sometimes we don't know, we don't, we don't see anything. So is a dog able to fully recover from Lyme or does Lyme stay dormant in their body? And then it has the potential to rear its ugly head if they get really sick a secondary time with uh, something else. Um, the experts, that I listened to in a webinar earlier this week, um, say that, that, that if you treat it, you'll get rid of it. And so when we see a problem happening again, it's probably a new infection. So how would you treat it? So it's usually treated with doxycycline for 30 days. Um, and in some of the really chronic cases, you might go longer than 30 days, uh, but interestingly, dogs that test positive with Lyme antibodies, um, even after treatment can remain positive for in this particular study that this uh, expert was talking about up to 560 days. So anecdotally, I mean, so I've been working with herbs for like 20 plus years and we've always looked at Teasel though. And there's some recent studies that have come out showing that the leaf um, as aspect of the Teasel plant actually has um, a potential source for the antiborrelia bio, um, the bioactivity. So there is potential, I think, that they're looking now at phytochemicals and seeing another alternative, oh, yeah. because I know there is a lot of people out there, you know, that rightfully so, you don't want to use antibiotics all the time, but in a case like Lyme, it sounds like that is the way to go if it's active. Now, how do you determine 
if it, and we'll get into whether your advice on vaccines or not, but how do you determine the difference of if a dog is testing positive because they have the positive antibodies from the vaccine versus if they're actually positive? Oh, okay. So uh, there, you actually can tell the difference between vaccine antibodies and um, actual organism antibodies. Okay. So the test that we used in my practice uh, was through Antec Lab, but um, it, it was called an Acuplex, but it was the heartworm. It, it's, it's similar to the 40X. Um, but on that test under Lyme, it would say no antibodies found or vaccine antibodies found or acute or chronic um, exposure. Uh, so that's a, a great test because it let me know. And interestingly, I would have dogs who had had a vaccine eight to 10 years earlier that the test was still picking up vaccine antibodies. So a lot of times they're staying there for a lot longer than what we think. So, you know, I don't think we have enough information on the vaccine to, and we don't do titers on that. So we don't know how long the vaccines really last. And actually the vaccines that have been being used were horrible anyway, so it shouldn't be used. Um, but then, segue. <laughs> yeah, but um, there is, so IDEX, which is a different lab, they have something called a quant C6, a quantitative C6, which is a Lyme antibody. Um, and they say that anything less than 30 means your dog is fine, doesn't need to be treated. Anything over 30, your dog should be treated. But this is where we get into a huge um, do we or do we not treat. Um, for instance, I have a client in Ohio, her dog tested positive. She has not found a tick on her dog, but she's, you know, big dogs. And maybe there was a nymph on there that she didn't know about. Dog tested positive. She had the C6 down. It was 45. Dog has zero symptoms, zero symptoms. So she treated because it was a 45. Now, this has been a longstanding question. If you have an animal with zero symptoms, do you treat or do you not treat? Or do they just have antibodies, meaning their body kicked it out or not? Now that Beagle study that I was talking about, and, and again, they were doing this to, to get a vaccine proposal. Um, but they had puppies who were getting the vaccine, puppies who were getting the placebo, puppies who got nothing, and they infected everybody. And they did at the end of the study, so the puppies were a year or two old at the end of the study, um, they did sacrifice the puppies and do histopathology on all of their tissues. So the kidney tissue, the liver tissue, all of that. Um, and even in the one, so they didn't treat anybody who got sick, like nobody got treated. And they all, like I said, they all, the ones that did show symptoms were very transient symptoms. When they did antibody testing on the ones who hadn't been vaccinated, they were all positive for the antibodies. They didn't treat anybody because that wasn't part of the study. They did, so even though most of them didn't have any symptoms, when they looked at the histopathology, so microscopically looked at the tissues, the kidney tissue, the liver tissue, the muscle tissue, the joint tissues, they found cytologic changes, histopathologic changes in every organ in the animals who were positive versus the ones who were not infected. So um, that kind of makes you say, hmm, you know, we're not treating these animals that have antibody positive with zero symptoms, because especially in a holistic practice like mine, we're like, well, why am I treating him for something that, you know, doesn't, he's, he's got nothing. Like, why would I treat him? Um, especially if I'm getting back a test that says he's got chronic, I'm like, well, he hasn't had any symptoms at all. And he still doesn't have any symptoms. Like he's not having kidney problems. He's not having heart problems. Like why would I want to treat this? Um, but then when you look at studies where they look at histopathology and you're like, oh, well, there are changes there. We just don't know it. Right. But if they're not causing symptoms, I mean, maybe they're not, I don't, I don't know. Like th there's so much that we don't know about these things. And believe me, I'm not somebody who uses antibiotics very often at all for my animals or myself. Like I'm just right. not a fan. <laughs> Ditto. Um, so, uh, you know, oh, so one of the things um, that we started doing in our practice, if we got an animal with a positive test and they had zero symptoms, 
we would run a urinalysis. And this is actually one of the things that's recommended by the, um, the experts. Run a urinalysis. If they're leaking protein in their urine, the kidneys are being affected by the okay. Lyme organism. So if their urine, if their urinalysis is perfectly normal, they're concentrating their urine, there's no protein in the urine, and they're asymptomatic, but you just got a positive test, probably don't treat. But if they're leaking protein in their urine, their kidneys are being affected, probably treat. So we're going to have a lot of people that are watching this. And I would like to think that most of them live a holistic lifestyle and they have their pets do the same, but let's be realistic. It's probably not the case. What do you say to those people that go to the conventional vets who are now listening and learning from you and are saying, wait a second, maybe I don't need to be pushing, you know, all these antibiotics and messing up their microbiome and, you know, kind of compromising their immune system because their immune system seems to be clearing the bacteria on its own. What do you say to them so that they can have a, a, an understanding with their vet that they're not crazy, right? Because right. Like so what they, uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we have to educate the veterinarians. <laughs> um, so what they need to do is uh, really understand what it is that they're presenting to the veterinarian. Say, well, look, my dog doesn't have any symptoms. I understand we got a positive test. I haven't pulled any ticks off, or if I did, they, you know, were just crawling on the dog. They weren't blown up, um, whatever. My dog's shown no symptoms at any point that I've seen. I'm with my dog all the time. Uh, I want to run a urine sample. So just say to your veterinarian, look, okay, great. We got a positive blood test. You know what? They can be wrong. Um, we do get false positives and false negatives. Um, say to them, I'm going to bring you a urine sample. Check this. Oh, two plus protein. Okay, you win. I'm going to treat my dog. Uh, no protein. Hey, I think my dog's okay. You know, if you're really worried, maybe it's affecting the heart, like in my mom's dog. Say, well, okay, good. That's great. We'll do an EKG. Oh, that's normal too. <laughs> you know, how much money do you want to spend? But um, there are also herbal treatments and homeopathic treatments that can be used. Um, and I've had some clients, some of my holistic clients who said, nope, I'm not giving antibiotics. You can't make me. And I'm like, that's fine. You don't have to. Um, and uh, we have herbal formulas. I've had with the herbal formulas, sometimes you have to give them longer. Yeah. Um, like Jing Tang Herbal has a Chinese herbal formula um, <clears throat> called Lime Formula, of all things. Um, Which I actually think has Teasel in it, just in the TCM. Yeah. So I don't know um, that name. You know, and there's a, another expert who he says to use cat's claw, a combination of cat's claw and the Japanese knotweed powders. Yeah. Um, and then he also uses leadum homeopathically. So, yeah. um, so you can, you know, there are alternative treatments that you certainly can try. And we plant medicine is great. If you give your animals the chance, if I allow my dogs out into my herb garden or my cats out into my herb garden, they pick what they want. They, they will go through, they'll choose, um, and horses, the same thing, plant a bunch of different shrubs in your hedgerow, plant, plant herbs, they'll go pick what they need. Um, I mean, that so, is the definition of zoo pharmacognosy, right? Yeah. They're, they're and, watching them medicate and themselves. plant medicine has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Uh, doxycycline has not. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we definitely uh, have alternative methods that we can use. Um, now if I had an animal who was really sick, uh, you know, the kidneys were in trouble, I'd probably be more prone to say, <laughs> you know what, I'm going to take some traditional yeah. medicine right this minute. Uh, and then I'm going to support the body in every way I can to make up for, because doxycycline will affect the microbiome for sure, but it also affects the liver. It can cause a lot of other problems. So we don't want to use antibiotics without a clear cut reason to use them. Overuse of, of antimicrobials is killing our planet. It's killing people. It is killing animals. Um, so we don't want to use them unless we have clear cut reasons to do so. And so in, in my practice and in my opinion, all of those animals that were completely asymptomatic and, you know, we got a positive test and they're like, you know, I haven't pulled any ticks off and he's got no symptoms and his urine's clear. I'm not treating. 
I've personally had a lot of luck and a lot of my customers and the nutrition clients I work with, with, with using Leadum when you find a tick and you pull the tick off and just doing that like acute methodology yep. of giving it to them and then doing it 24 hours later. And Japanese knotweed, again, for those people that don't know, it's really high in re uh, reversterol. So that is um, something else along with the teasel that they have been doing a lot of research on. And I love phytochemicals and everything that we can do to support yep. the body that way. Um, so with that being said, where do you stand on the Lyme vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, before I start talking about that, one thing I do want to, um, I have a couple things. Uh, if you pull a tick off your dog and you are concerned about, you know, you pull off a full blown tick, uh, and you're concerned, uh, and you want to have them tested, there is a place called TickCheck.com. Send in, you mail in your tick and they'll test it for 10 different diseases. Uh, so you can find out, was it carrying Lyme? Was it carrying, you know, 10 other things. So uh, tickcheck.com, I think is a great resource that not enough people use. Um, I don't think it's that expensive, but I think it's certainly worth it if you are concerned. Let's say you pull uh, a, a blown up deer tick off your dog and you go, oh crap, I checked him, but I must have missed that one. It was hiding under his ear flap, whatever. Um, I think sending them in and knowing for sure, like if the tick is positive for pick a disease, um, then you're going to be more vigilant watching for symptoms. Like you don't, you wouldn't miss that acute phase that might be very mild. You wouldn't miss it if you really knew that you had to be looking for it. So, um, so I think that's important. Um, but, uh, <laughs> there was a study at the university of Pennsylvania. So, and this, um, this goes along with what I said that the, um, I don't know if I, I might have said it before we started, uh, the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, the veterinarians, the ACBIM board certified veterinarians do not recommend the use of Lyme vaccine, which is pretty it interesting. a lot. Yeah. To, say, to have traditional veterinarians say, yeah, we don't like that vaccine. Um, so Merrill Lipman, who's a doctor at University of Pennsylvania, did a study um, with all the animal dogs that had been tested at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, said that 95% of exposed dogs don't get sick, but become Lyme antibody positive on their tests. So we've got 95% of the dogs never get sick, never have symptoms. So why are we treating them? So that's the first big question. Um, and in some areas of New England, 70 to 90% of healthy dogs are Lyme positive. 70 to 90%. So, you know, if you live in Lyme, Connecticut, my sister lives in Massachusetts. She sends her dogs out. She has her yard treated with, uh, she had everything mowed down. She treats her yard with, uh, professionally treated with cedar oils. And her dogs still come in with six to eight ticks every time they go outside. But yeah. they're crawling on them. So she just pulls them right. off. Uh, but uh, let's see. And at University of Pennsylvania, 40% of healthy dogs test positive for Lyme. So, you know, these are healthy dogs. And we're just routinely doing tests. And that's just what we're getting. Um, because the... East Coast, Northeast is just a huge hotbed. So as far as the vaccine goes, what we have had in the past are really bad vaccines. Um, at their most effective, if your dog had ever been exposed to Lyme, uh, they're only 60% effective. So you can vaccinate your dog and they still can get Lyme disease. Um, they're if you start them as a young puppy, I think they were labeled for 10 weeks and older. So if you started them with their Lyme series when they were young puppies, um, it had about an 80% efficacy. That's not very good as far as vaccines go. Like the, you know, the rabies vaccine is like 99.99%. That's kind of where you need to be um, if you're going to be giving a vaccine. So not very effective. And there is some question about whether they actually cause more problems because what actually causes the kidney failure and what actually causes the myocarditis and the joint disease are what we call antigen antibody complexes. So the more antibody is running around in the body and then they get exposed to Lyme disease. So they get bitten by an infected tick and they've got all these antibodies in their body. So the, the antigen, which is the organism from the tick, the antibodies, from the body, they lock together like puzzle pieces and they form these antigen antibody complexes, which are pretty large molecules. Those molecules are deposited in the kidney tubules and also within the joints and in the heart, between the heart muscles. And that's what causes all the inflammatory response. 
So by making more antibody, are we making the problem worse? Well, that's what they saw with the human vaccine. And that's why it only stayed on the market for about 18 months because you know people were literally maimed for life. They were crippled because now they've got all these huge antigen antibody complexes stuck in their joints. And so now they can't walk. They literally have worse Lyme disease than if they hadn't been vaccinated. So the, you know, I was never a fan of the vaccines because uh, they weren't very effective. Well, recently uh, they came out with a completely different kind of vaccine. Um, this vaccine was uh, researched by Zoetis and it's called Vanguard CR Lyme. If, if I had a client who was bound bent and determined they wanted to have their dog vaccinated, I would insist on this vaccine. Um, because what it, <laughs> it I'm going to use a couple big words. It's, uh, an epitope chimeric protein or a chimerotope. Um, so what they did, there's these little kind of bumpy outcroppings on the spirochete and the, the Lyme bacteria is a spirochete. It's a little spiral. So if you see them in a microscope, they look like these little spirals swimming around and on their surface, they have these little bumps and they are called OSP proteins. It's an outer something protein. Um, and so they have OSP A and OSP C. What they did with this chimerotrope is they made something against the OSP C, but there's 30 different ones on these little spirochetes. So trying to make a vaccine that had all of those in there um, was difficult, but they figured out how to do it. And so this particular vaccine actually clears the spirochetes out of the body. Um, and so that was the Beagle study that I was talking about. And the dogs that they gave the OSP C vaccine, um, it's a really interesting study. Uh, no histopathologic changes. None of the dogs got sick. So even though, the because they were given the same number of ticks that were infected to bite them and all of that, none of them got sick. And then when they did the sacrifice, when they were adults, there were no histopathologic changes in those dogs, which meant that they were able to kick the the organism out completely. Um, and I think they compared it with the older type of vaccine and that didn't work at all. What are they uh, saying the efficacy is of this vaccine? This one's going to be a lot higher, much, much, much higher. And um, so you wouldn't have to worry about the antigen antibody complex that you just- Right, because it actually is clearing it out. Um, so if I, if I were going to vaccinate, like I don't vaccinate my dogs. So <laughs> I probably you know. should, I should probably <laughs> stop saying this online. We tighter. No, just say we tighter. Tighter. We tighter. Uh, I don't even tighter anymore because my dogs don't go anywhere. Um, <laughs> literally we have 26, 23 acres and they have an acre fence and that's, that's what they see. So, um, but uh, if I were in practice and if I had people who wanted a vaccine because they were overly concerned or you know i mean you live in lyme connecticut you got a good reason to be you live in rhode island you, you've got yeah. a good reason you're in new england you've got a good reason to be concerned um i mean certainly my feeling again is keep the ticks off because we have to worry about other tick-borne diseases as well right but if you were going to vaccinate you need to ask for this cr vaccine uh because i think um you know after looking at the studies and i actually went and looked at the looked at the um the pubmed articles on this in the studies um it's a lot different a lot different and uh if if they come out with another human line vaccine it will be this um modeled off of this it'll be this model yeah, yeah exactly so um i think this will be a lot different and we won't get the problems that we had so at least we're looking at you know a different type of technology and something that's going to not cause problems. Now, with that said, the vaccine's fairly young. I think it's been out for a year, maybe. Um, but it's a fairly young vaccine. So, you know, would I jump on it right away? Well, if I were going to vaccinate for Lyme, I'd jump on this one because I know the old one doesn't work. Right. I, I know the old one can cause more problems. So, um, but, you know, the truth will come out in the next couple of years as we see more dogs getting the vaccine and, um, you know, when they're getting it year after year, after year. 
<laughs> the problem is a lot of those dogs that are getting this vaccine year after year, they're also getting other vaccines year after year. Oh, right. Yeah. They're getting over vaccinated in every anyway, way anyway. possible. Anyway. Right. And who knows how long this one lasts. Um, I was just going to ask if they mentioned that. Yeah, I think they're recommending an annual vaccine still. Um, that seems to be the tagline on any vaccine. <laughs> we just do it every year. Um, so, and again, because it's such new technology, I don't, I don't think they have enough years into it to be testing, you know, it, what it's going to take is clinical trials where you put on infected ticks and, you know, you give them that one vaccine or two at the beginning and then you challenge them year after year after year. So you wouldn't know, like, if does that vaccine last 10 years? You're not gonna know unless you keep a colony of dogs and challenge them. This is why we don't get these live studies with large groups of animals, because it's, it's, it's a lot of work for them to do that. Um, but that's the only way we're, we will really know in the long run. Yeah, so you mentioned about uh, prevention, which is obviously really important as much as we can to prevent dogs from biting our ticks. So I personally, everyone that knows me knows I only use all natural products. I use a cedar wood based sometimes with a uh, eugenol and peppermint, depending on where we're at. Um, and, you know, I take the, the practice of when ticks are at their highest, which is going to be right about now because it's perfect weather in New England for all the ticks to be coming out. We're not going into tall grass, right? We're kind of modifying where we're going. And yes, it's a pain in the butt, but at the end of the day, my dog's health is worth that. So, you know, thinking about all the people that are listening to their vets because it is quote being prescribed, right? To have these neurotoxins that are going through chews, through spot ons, through shampoos, through collars, you know, what are we doing to our dogs? What are we doing to their immune system by overloading them with all of these chemicals. And then on top of that, the vaccines that you just talked about, because they're getting them every year, aren't we setting our dogs up and their immune systems up to fail? So when they get bit, they aren't stacked up to do anything with it. Their bodies just succumb. Exactly. I mean, they just, they can't fight it. Interestingly, you know, people, I get so many people who email and say, um, oh, I tried all the different natural things. You know, I tried everything you said, none of it worked, blah, blah, blah. Um, I got invited to speak at the Pointer National Specialty in Ohio quite a few years ago. And one of my clients was also there. She was showing her dog. So part the Pointer Nationals is really fun because part of it is they do a field trial. They go out in the field and the dogs hunt. So, you know, here we've got a hundred dogs that are going out in the field with their owners to do field work and so they're in tall grass and they're in the woods you know they're they're doing field work and so she had taken an essential oil spray that um i had in my practice at the time and she sprayed herself and her dog with that before they went out in the field at the end of the day she came in with zero ticks on her or her dog every other dog in that field every other owner in that field they were covered. And most of them had some sort of spot on. This was uh, actually before, no, the oral ones were out. Um, but, the, you know, so all these dogs are on spot ons and they're on, you know, all these different products. What people don't understand for the most part is they don't repel ticks. They right. don't repel. They kill the tick after it attaches to your dog. It's had a blood meal from your dog. It's spent a lot of time on your dog. Um, whereas, you know, she's using essential oil spray. It repelled. It did a great job. So of course the next day, what does everybody want? You know, I, <laughs> you know, I think I had a few bottles with me and I started handing out bottles and she, you know, shared hers with everybody. Um, but it, it was just like the greatest test. It's like, okay, we got a hundred dogs. 99 came in covered in ticks. Yeah. The mm -hmm. one who had the essential oils did not. And you know, the thing to think about, which I know you know this very well, but most pet parents, I, I think they don't want to think about it. If a chemical is paralyzing an insect that's biting your dog, what is it doing to your dog's central nervous system? Right? Uh, I have a, a great video that uh, we have used quite a bit from a client in Belgium, I believe, uh, a little cocker spaniel. And 
he got two Cocker Spaniel puppies at the same time, took them to the vet for their, you know, second set of vaccines um, after getting them from the breeder. And the vet gave them both one of the chewable neurotoxins. And this little guy, the, the little female Cocker got very sick, vomiting, diarrhea for a few days. The male, within a couple of days, started with seizures. So he's, a, and so the guy took lots of videos of those seizures in the vet office. Of course, the veterinarians are like, no, it can't be. It can't be from the neurotoxin where it says <laughs> right on the label may cause seizures. Um, can't be from that. Um, and so we've been detoxing this dog for almost a year. And he was on three different seizure meds. I think he's down to one, but he still has seizures. Um, he can't can't get off the last med. Um, and so we're a year out. This, this guy's probably got seizures for life. And that's one dose. And I get people that say, well, you know, I've been giving it, haven't had any problems. You don't have any problems until you do. Right. Because some of these dogs, like even in the clinical trials for, for one of the oral products, uh, they tested like 215 dogs. That was their test group originally. And one of the dogs dropped dead after the third dose and they couldn't decide why when they did the blood test, it had an overwhelmingly high amount of the product. Like it wasn't clearing it from its body. Mm -hmm. They never figured out why they didn't care why they just said it was a one-off. So it didn't die until the third dose and the company wrote it off as a one-off. Now that's one dog out of 200. So if there are millions of doses sold, Let's take that same percentage. That's a lot of animals that can be killed. Yeah. And so for me, using the neurotoxins is Russian roulette. It's, is this the one that's going to kill my dog? Or my I'm cat? A, yeah, and I'm not willing to gamble. And nor are you. And yeah, it's, I wish more people would understand the message that you're saying, because it's not your opinion. This is science. Like this is science. This is I mean, science. we have we have the FDA reports. We have the EU reports. We um, we had a conversation, a phone call with veterinarians, researchers. Like we we did a survey, and we actually got a phone call with the FDA based on our survey because it was such a high percentage. It was like sixty five percent of the people who used pick a neurotoxin, any of them, whether it was a spot on an oral, whatever. It's like 65% of the people reported side effects, including death. And so when we had our conversation with the FDA, we said, this is a huge number. And the, the problem is, and, and there have been hundreds of thousands of reports to the FDA and to the European agency that's similar to the FDA, hundreds of thousands of reports. And they said, it's not enough. And you know, our response to them was, you know, only 1%, it is estimated that only 1% of reactions to medications, vaccines, food problems, whatever, only 1% get reported. So if 200,000 is only 1% of what's happening, we have a big, big problem. Big problem. Uh, but the problem is, like, I had somebody email me and say, well, my vet gave my dog the oral chewable pesticide while we were there at the office visit. And within a couple of hours, my dog started having bloody vomit and diarrhea, ran back to the veterinarian and said, I, you know, that thing you gave my dog caused this. And they said, oh, no, no, it's not that. Wow. You wow. know, so if we've got the veterinary professionals saying, no, there's no correlation. When they give your dog a neurotoxin and a week or two weeks or three weeks later, your dog starts having seizures and they're in denial that that could be the cause of the problem. We have a big problem. Yes. Um, I actually, my office manager uh, used to do beagle rescue. And so she got this beagle in that the family could no longer keep because it was having seizures. They couldn't afford the seizure medicine, which was on phenobarb, which is cheap, but they just couldn't deal with this dog having seizures all the time because it wasn't controlled. So we got the medical records for the dog. Once a month, the owner stopped at the vet clinic, picked up her dose of oral neurotoxin for fleas. Wow, she kept giving the neurotoxins? Right. Picked up that dose with the dose of phenobar. Now, what is wrong with the veterinarian that is dispensing a neurotoxin that causes seizures 
at the, the same exact drug. time that they're handing them anti-seizure medication. So this is this this is one of my rants. Like, you know, it's like everybody loves my rants. But why is that veterinarian not smart enough to go neurotoxin, phenobarbital? Huh? Probably shouldn't give those together. No, you know, it just goes to really say it even louder that we have to be our advocates for our dogs that at the end of the day and you have to everyone and you have to use your brain and you have to know like you have to know that that's a neurotoxin that could be causing seizures and oh geez my dog's having seizures i shouldn't give that like you may still be one of those people who says well i need some sort of protection against fleas and ticks well you don't need that particular one because that one's a problem and there are the, the natural remedies or natural preventatives, I should say. They're not 100% accurate. A lot of times, the people that use the sprays and the essential oil sprays, which I am an advocate for, it's user error. If you miss a spot, a tick is going to crawl. And if it's going to try to crawl off but finds a spot you haven't sprayed, it's going to nestle in, right? So there is some responsibility on the applicator, meaning me, when I go to spray my dog, and just consistency. I spray my dogs every day. You yeah, know, there's, a, there's also um, in different areas, and I found this to be really interesting, certain essential oils work better for different dogs in different areas. So for instance, my sister, who's in Massachusetts and is having this huge tick problem, she has tried a bunch of different ones. So she's tried lavender, she's tried lemongrass, and she said, you know what's working the best? The rose geranium. In her particular yard with her particular dogs, that's the one that happens to be working best this year. Um, so, it, you know, if you're using a product and you're like, not doing anything, switch to something else. Try a different flavor. Try a different scent. First of all, you have to like the scent because you got to live with it. Right. <laughs> uh, but you may, you may need to layer on some other things. Maybe you need to be feeding your dog coconut oil. Maybe you need to be feeding your dog garlic. Maybe you need to be, and if you're picking up ticks in your own yard, you need to be treating that yard. So my sister keeps doing the cedar oil thing, but I really think what she needs to do is put some nematodes out there because yeah. the nematodes are going to take care of those nymphs and that would take care of a lot of her problem. So maybe that'll be the next thing I send her, <laughs> but you, can you know, also, layer on different things that are, yeah, and you can yeah, layer there are tick tags. Extent. Yeah. So there's the ultrasonic tags. There's the, the amber collars. I mean, there's so many different things and I don't know how effective those are. Some of them have great studies behind them. Some of them, it's all just anecdotal, you know, like, you know, I don't have any ticks on my dog. Great. Maybe you live in an area where you don't have ticks. I don't know, but you know what? Try it, layer it on. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, putting an amber collar on your dog or an ultrasonic tick tag is not going to hurt the dog. And if it helps go for it. Um, but I don't think that those by themselves are going to be enough particularly in New England. So I would say, yes, you're going to have to use essential oils, but I've got a blog on my website. Um, it's flea and tick Pre prevention revisited because there's an older one. And then I revisited it and added some more stuff in. Um, but it has a ton of different uh, natural methods of prevention for both your yard and for your pets. So for instance, if you have a lot of um, flower beds and plantings in your yard and mulch and that sort of thing, or you know the tall ornamental grasses, well, that's where the ticks are gonna wanna hang out. So you've gotta keep deer out of your yard. So plant some deer repellent plants, deer resistant plants, and you've gotta keep mice and voles and those sorts of things out of your yard. I've got kittens, anybody want a cat to keep the moles <laughs> out of your yard? Um, so, you know, but those, you've gotta think of all the different places where they might be hanging out and all the different ways you might be able to cut down that population. And like you said, hiking, like I won't take my dogs. We're surrounded by woods. So if I wanted to take my dogs for a nice little hike through the wooded paths, I guarantee I'm going to come back here with ticks. I don't take them there. They don't need to go there with me. It's fine. <laughs> we go in the end of July and early August because it's hot enough yeah. where the ticks are not out. Exactly. So not, and I don't mean I'm taking my dogs in the heat of day, obviously I'm practicing right. safe, safe temperature exercising, but you know, and another point to those people that do not live around woods that do not live in an area where there there's a predisposition for ticks and fleas, please just don't give that neurotoxin. There's no need to give it to your dog. So just let it be and leave it there and save your money. 
because a lot of times when, and I hate to say it, when we go to our conventional vets, we just, whatever they, they put in our bag, we pay for, go home and give, and we don't ask the questions. So, well, the worst problem is that with these new chewables, very commonly a technician or a veterinarian is handing that to your dog in the exam room and sometimes without even making you aware until after the fact. So what would you do? You'd have them put a note on your file to say, do not, like, how would you recommend to the pet parent? So I took a couple of our barn kitties in to be spayed to my, because I don't have a license in North Carolina. So I'm now on the other side of the table. I took my kitties in to be spayed. And on the form, it says, if we find any external parasites on your pet, we will treat them and you will be charged initial here. I went, eh, eh, <laughs> and wrote on there in big letters, do not put any chemicals on or in my cats. Call me. Perfect. So, you know, and I would say, a, get a big red sticker on your chart where, you know, if it's computerized, well, I don't know how you do that, but whatever, uh, put a big note around your dog's neck. Um, we have the curbside thing is the worst thing that's ever happened to our animals because things are happening that we don't know yeah. about. Mm -hmm. um, but very commonly, your animal is also taken to the back away from you and things happen that you don't know about. Uh, somebody emailed me the other day. They asked for a DAP vaccine. They said, okay. They got a DAPP with lepto. And they said, no, I didn't want lepto. Well, you can't get it out because it's already in. Um, so on my website, we have a free download. It's called the, uh, I think it's still called the curbside veterinary checklist, but it literally is, I don't know, two or three pages of questions that you get to fill out. And if you print it out in color, if not, you can get your highlighter. And in about 10 places in there, it says, do not give anything to my animal without asking first. And, you know, then it's got the vaccine section, do not give any or give this one um, or do a tighter. Uh, but it literally, it asks you all the questions so that you don't forget things when you're there, because that always happens. You go and then you go home and go, oh, I forgot to ask me. look at that lump. So it asks you questions so that you're really well prepared and that you have all of your questions ready when you go. But, and I, it's funny because I've had some people hand it to their veterinarian and the veterinarian goes, I don't have time to read all that. And they're like, okay, let me point out the highlights to you. Right. right. So, <laughs> so, um, so for everyone, that's at drjudymorgan.com is the website that Dr. Judy is referring to that has a plethora of resources and information. I could talk to you all day long. I have a feeling that everyone you talk to probably says that same thing, but um, <laughs> You're just, uh, you're fascinating and you're just such a wealth of knowledge. And I love how commonsensical you are. I think it's something that is really missing in today's world. And it's really refreshing to have a conversation and a dialogue. Um, what I'd love to do is another time, and I won't hold you to it, is have you come back and let's talk about the immune system and how people can really build their dog's immune system. We've had you for almost an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, otherwise, we'd spend another 30 or 40 minutes talking about that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much. Um, if anyone has questions for you or wants to reach out to you, where can they find you? So uh, our website's drjudymorgan.com. I'm also on Facebook at Judy Morgan DVM, but I don't always have time to read stuff that comes in through there. So you're much better off to email us, info at drjudymorgan.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you and love that you spent time out of your day to help us. And thank you so much. Well, thank you.